Um, and we'll get to that point a little bit later. I'm just going to skip a few slides here while everybody's moving. Um, so I want to skip ahead and tell you a few stories that I think are relevant to our purposes here today. And my first concerns a critique of the biological race concept articulated by W.E.B. Du Bois, the great sociologist and historian who helped found the NAACP and became one of the most distinguished um, leaders and tireless voices for African American equal rights and racial reconciliation during the first half of the 20th century. In 1906, Du Bois, then a young social scientist at Atlanta University, issued a forceful and elegant challenge to the race concept and of, to scientific racism in his book, The Health and Physique of the Negro American, which was published in 1906. In the pages of The Health and Physique, Du Bois attacked the very foundation of American racial ideology, calling into question the scientific legitimacy of the race concept, that is, the belief that the peoples of the world can be organized into biologically distinctive groups, each with their own physical, social, and intellectual characteristics, at a time when, through the eugenics movement, science was being exploited in the service of racist ideas and practices. Du Bois's work serves as a landmark in anti-racist thinking and scholarship for its repudiation of both the race concept and the popular belief that disparities between races in disease morbidity and mortality were biological in nature. And for those of you um, familiar with the public health literature, this is a raging argument in public health right now, what accounts for disparities in health between populations. Um, and Du Bois was talking about this 100 years ago. Du Bois anticipated the lines along which many geneticists and other natural scientists would, over the course of the 20th century, struggle with the scientific and social meanings of race and predicted how the natural sciences would be put into services defending and demarcating the color line. Du Bois implicitly understood the danger of what was going on in biology and in the emerging field of genetics. He wrote, the world was thinking wrong about race because it didn't know it. The ultimate evil was stupidity. And Du Bois would later write um, that his cure for American racism was knowledge based on scientific evidence. And in this and in his many of his other early works, he set out to utilize the scientific method to show that the race concept was no more than an unscientific expression of America's racial mores. What makes his book unique is that at a moment when the concept of race was being appropriated by biology, Du Bois was the first to synthesize a literature which argued that race was not, in fact, a useful scientific category, and argued instead that race was a socially constructed concept. And remember, he was doing this at the beginning of the 20th century, at a time when the historian um, Rayford Logan calls the nadir of American race relations. Um, and he was doing this to potential harm to himself, to his career, um, and yet Du Bois um, continued to write about this issue throughout his career and became a tireless voice, um, an anti-racist voice, um, throughout the first half of the 20th century. Now, he built his argument in the following way. First, he began the health and physique by writing that Americans are eagerly and often bitterly discussing race problems because they are behind the scientific times. He frames his critique of the, the emerging science of race as a scientific argument. He says that he has evidence um, that can show, in fact, that this is the wrong way to be thinking about this. Um, Americans, excuse me, sorry. Um, and the book cites what he called advances in the anthropological science um, made during the last decade in support of his argument. Second, Du Bois directly attacks the race concept, but he did it first by attacking the category of whiteness, pointing out that it may smack of heresy to assert in the face of the teaching of all of our textbooks on geography and history that there is no single European or white race of men, and yet that is the plain truth, he wrote. Third, Du Bois extended his attack on race on the idea of a discrete black race generally and of an African American race specifically, writing that the human species so shade and mingle with each other that it is impossible to draw a color line between black and other races. Du Bois also called into question the idea of a pure black person, highlighting that the Negro American represents a very wide and thorough blending of nearly all African people from north to south, and more than that, a blending of European and African blood. Fourth and finally, oops, 
Du Bois, attacked the race concept, du Bois' attack on the race concept went beyond pure intellectual deduction, supporting his critiques of the race concept with quantitative data about alleged racial differences, drawing on census data, public health data, and data and conclusions from previously published studies, some of which were studies used in support of the race concept. He cobbled together a vision of race and of African Americans contrary to how most Americans were thinking about this matter. In an answer to claims by 19th century anthropologists, polygenists, and craniologists that Africans and African Americans had smaller cranial capacity and hence inferior intelligence, Du Bois presented evidence that no differences in brain size or structure had been proven and that variability within the races is similar. Also, in looking at other physiognomic data, Du Bois acknowledged the significant variability within and between races. And finally, Du Bois articulated a critique against the belief that disparities in health were racial and biological in nature. In Du Bois's analysis, health disparities were not caused by biological differences between human groups, but were rather an index of a social condition and used data from uh, the U.S. Army recruitment records, from the U.S. Census, and from the Freedmen's Inquiry Commission of 1863 to make his point. Ultimately, he said, poverty and the conditions of life were the real causes of health disparities. Now, what's interesting is that if you look at a recent paper uh, by um, Venter et al. in 2008, um, Venter also calls into question, as you know, 100 years following Du Bois, the term Caucasian. Even the term Caucasian can be deceptive. If a self-identified Caucasian originates from a founder population in which certain disease-specific alleles occur at higher frequencies, his or her doctor may miss an important aspect of the patient's medical history. One's ethnicity of race is, at best, a probabilistic guess at one's true genetic makeup. Now, when Venter and his colleagues do this study, they had advanced genetic technology to do this. When Du Bois did his study, he had the power of observation, essentially, and the collection of data that he did um, in a very different way. Now, Du Bois's disagreement with popular and scientific notions of the biological fitness of black Americans came at a time when the association of race and disease was generally accepted as conventional wisdom. African Americans were thought to be biologically susceptible to a variety of diseases, including syphilis and tuberculosis. Um, the historian James Jones has documented, for example, how at the beginning of the 20th century, at the beginning of the 20th century, physicians depicted syphilis as the quintessential black disease, and this attitude fostered a climate where what became the Tuskegee study of untreated syphilis in African Americans could continue for 40 years. Du Bois was also writing at a time when racial science was on the rise in scientific circles. At the outset of the 20th century, explanations for racial differences once based on measurable and observable physical traits gave way to a whole new way of thinking about the subject that understood race to be a reflection of the unseen differences that were genes. Now, that comes about at the outset of the eugenics movement, and the eugenics movement dominates despite Du Bois's critique, ideas about race during the first three to four decades of the 20th century. Now, science starts to catch up to Du Bois. By the 1930s, there were others, including historians, um, political scientists, and slowly biologists who articulated um, the same types of critique of the race concept that Du Bois had almost 30 years earlier. Um, but, and by the 1930s, the field of genetics starts to understand why, in essence, Du Bois was right. During that decade, an increasing number of geneticists begin to understand human genetic diversity through the lenses of population genetics and evolutionary biology. And this approach rejected a eugenic notion of fixed genetic differences between so-called racial groups and instead understood human races as dynamic populations distinguished by variations in the frequency of genes in that population. By rooting the meaning of race in genetic variation, it became more difficult, though still possible, to argue that one race or another had particular traits specifically associated with it or that one individual was typical of a particular race. These changes, driven by changing technological, methodological, and ontological approaches in evolutionary biology and genetics, coalesced in the 1930s to what became known as the evolutionary or modern synthesis, a Darwinian fusion of three research traditions, theoretical population genetics, theoretical population genetics, experimental genetics, and taxonomy and natural history. 
For our purposes here today, it's important to note that the synthesis also reshaped the way the biological sciences conceptualized and an analyzed human difference. Prior to the synthesis, as I've said, genosis were stuck in the mode of thought in which species and populations were not seen as highly variable, um, but rather as uniform types. And this failure to conceptualize genetic variation led directly to the belief in the existence of uniform types or races as they were commonly known. Now, the redefinition of race in the context of the evolutionary synthesis was accomplished largely by the evolutionary biologist Theodosius Bajanski, who was, for most of his career, professor up the street at Columbia University. Um, he also had help from his colleague at Columbia, Elsie Dunn, the geneticist, and the anthropologist Ashley Montague, who for a time was the head of the anthropology department at Rutgers. Um, now, from Dobzhansky's perch as one of the most preeminent scientists of his time, and the preeminent evolutionary theorist of the 20th century, he had both the prestige and the audience to write on matters social as well as scientific. For an emigre from Russia who had only learned English upon his arrival in the United States, this was quite a feat. Now, Dobzhansky's purpose, seeking to redefine the biological concept of the human race in a genetic context, began in earnest in his classic work, Genetics and the Origin of Species, published um, in the late 1930s. While race itself is not the subject of the book, the importance of the concept of variation to the evolutionary synthesis meant that defining populations and other groupings of organisms received significant attention. By privileging variable over fixed populations, Dobzhansky's synthesis helped reconceptualize the idea of differences between and among populations of people. His description of the race concept in genetics and the origin of species must be considered one of the most important writings in the history of the subject, yet it has received little attention. This is surprising given Dobzhansky's standing in the field throughout the 20th century. Um, on the subject of race, he wrote, a living species is seldom a single homogenous population. Far more frequently, species are aggregates of races, each race possessing its own complex characteristics. The term race is used quite loosely to designate any subdivision of species which consists of individuals having common hereditary traits. In Genetics and the Origin of Species and many other later works, Dubjansky admitted to complications regarding the use of this term, troubled that so many diverse phenomenon have been subsumed under the name race, and the term itself became rather ambiguous. And Dubjansky worried at the unavoidable contradictions when applying the term, noting if races are described usually in terms of the statistical averages for all characters in which they differ from each other, it inevitably begins to serve as a racial standard with which individuals and groups of individuals can be compared. And Dobzhansky recognized the limits of this model. From the point of view of genetics, such an attempt to determine which race of a given individual belongs is sometimes an unmitigated fallacy. This is because, and this point is central to the modern synthesis's novel view of race, racial differences are more commonly due to variations in the relative frequencies of genes in different parts of the species populations than to an absolute lack of certain genes in some groups and their complete homozygosis in others. Individuals carrying or not carrying a certain gene may sometimes be found in many distinct races of a species. And by revealing the core contradiction of race in a population genetics context, Du Bois explicitly acknowledged the imprecise nature of the term, which he, in fact, was trying to give precision to. But he didn't stop there, and he noted in his writings where he went back and forth between embracing the race concept and between calling it ambiguous throughout the 30s, 40s, and 50s, that individuals of the same race may, be, may differ in more genes than individuals of different races, that units of racial variability are populations and genes, not the complex characteristics which connote in the popular mind racial distinction, that to understand race, the geography of the genes, not the average of phenotypes must be studied, and that variability of phenotypic traits is continuous. And um, yet despite Dobzhansky's insights into the limitations of the biological race concept, he refused for most of his career to jettison it. Um, now, what I want to skip ahead. So this brings me to uh, one of my final points in that Dobzhansky was stuck in a paradox. Um, and that is the simultaneous belief in the utility of the biological race concept in studies of human genetic diversity and the belief that the biological